Thank you. Yeah, hiya, uh, good morning. Oh, we're recording. Hiya, uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. My name is Daniel. I'm a PhD candidate at Oxford Brooks University in Oxford in England. Um, and you all know Christiane. She's one of my supervisors as well as Matthew Bulbert. If you give us a wave in your tiny boxes, the people might be able to see us. Hiya. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the Holoctonale of Australia, um, which is what I'm focusing my PhD on. So the first question you probably have is who are the Holoctonale? I'm going to try my best not to butcher as many words as I can um, throughout my whole presentation. Um, but if I say it in a strong British accent with authority, hopefully that makes it correct and everyone will go with what I say. So the Holoctonale they are a subfamily of assassin bugs, also known as feather-legged assassin bugs or ant wolves. And much like what it says on the tin, um, they are bugs with very feathery legs and they are also specialist predators of ants. Um, as you can see on the photo on the right, you've got a bug sucking some juices out of an ant and he has some very bristly legs right behind him. So in the Holoptonae, we have 80 species, that's across 16 genus, of which one is a fossil record, and they sit amongst three tribes. And um, those three tribes are Aradeleni, a word that I'm not even going to try to pronounce um, while I'm being recorded, and the Holoptonae, Holoptolines, sorry, um, which uh, that's the primary sort of tribe that I'm focusing my research on. Now these Holoptolines, they possess a specialist gland or organ uh, on the abdomen that releases a pheromone that uses to attract the ants. So they give off this pheromone, the ants give it a good sniff, they check it out, they come over, and during that process, they generally get predated upon. So I guess you could say that curiosity certainly killed the ants. Um, so with these 80 species is they are generally found and are restricted to old world continents, um, which are generally quite warm. So we have Africa, Asia, and also Australia. And this sort of map here represents some of the species that you will find all around the world. Um, so we have our African holoptolines, they move across to our Asian ones, such as Tillicerus, and then down to Australia, where we have species and genus such as the Tillicemus and Aridellus. Um, and one thing that we should note while we're moving across this sort of Africa to Australia is the bugs themselves have quite a notable difference in their formation. And um, so these African ones, if you First of all, if we look across the three pictures I've got here on the screen, is as they move across to Australia, their wings become tighter and more overlapped. And also the main structure of their feathery legs become wildly different. So in Africa, they're sort of, they're more spiky and spindly. In Asia, they're quite bushy and brushy, a bit like my beard. And then when we come to Australia, this species here, Tillicemus lima, and they have very compact, dense hairs. So we see a big sort of, range of leg morphology as well um, as we move across the world. So the first question you might be asking is, why aren't they called hairy legged assassin bugs? Um, well, this shot here that someone in Queensland Museum took for me, you can really see the detail of those hairs on the bug. Um, if you zoom in and press your face close to the screen, you can see they resemble more like tiny little feathers than the fluffy hairs, hence their name. Does everyone have a good face press on that? We have a nod on the yes. Um, so as well, around the world, most species and genus of uh, feather-legged assassin bugs tend to be around the same size. We don't see much variation in these genus, um, except for when we come to Australia and we find the genus Tillicemus. So we start to see an extreme size variation um, in these flaps. And in this Tillicemus genus, we have 12 known species, um, but they're quite cryptic and many of them we haven't really studied. We don't know their ecology, we like to eat, really where they like to live. We have rough ideas. And also some species, as we dive into them, there are a few differences. There could be more than these 12. Um, and some of these species as well, there's very few records of them. So for example, we have this species here on the left, which is Tillicemus darwinensis, which was found in Port Darwin. There's only one ever been found. Um, and then we also have Capudensis, also found in the Northern Territory, just sort of south, no, yeah, southeast of Darwin. Um, but only two have been found. So it's going to be my job to try and rediscover and find these bugs at some point. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is this huge size and body morphology difference restricted in this genus. Um, and this is two species here. On the left, we have femoralis, and on the right, we have exanguis. Um, and the T bars, they're the same size. So you can see it's quite a big shift in size difference. Their legs are slightly different. They're wildly different. So, what is causing this change? So there's something in Australia that's exclusive to that, to that country, to that island, 
that has caused this dramatic shift in body morphology that isn't seen in the other genuses of the Tillicinus. And so one theory we're working on is if anyone's ever been to Australia, um, they have very big and very aggressive ants. So if your prey is getting bigger and more aggressive, you probably also need to get bigger and more aggressive and start to adapt and deliver and drive into new niches. And um, so this is kind of we're looking at, you know, is this predator prey evolutionary arms race pushing this evolution, this change, or perhaps as Australia has, has such a diverse range of habitats, potentially that's what is causing it. So it is, how can we, or how can I over the next three years investigate these drivers? So I've been tasked with the very hard job of going to Australia a few times to collect these bugs. Um, I'm not going to lie. No, I'm going to lie. No, when you see a PhD advert, it says, do you want to do remote field work in Australia? Part of you just stops reading and starts scribbling down, like get me out of the British winter, anything will do. No, I'm kidding. I love my bugs. Um, so my role is to come to Australia and try and collect as many species of Tillisiums as we can, as well as observe, observe their preferences in habitat and also prey. If we can sort of see there's a consistent relationship between the ants they predate upon and the size of the Tillisiemus bug, maybe we can argue that there's a, some sort of driver in adaptive radiation that's caused this change. And another thing we can do as well is once we have all our bugs, we can crush them up and put them in the machine and produce a phylog phylogeny um, of the genus. So we can see where this evolutionary steps have taken place have they diverged? Has there been a very linear evolution from them? These are questions we need to ask and will help answer the question of what is driving this change in the Tillisemus. And again, I'm sure you've all heard of Darwin's finches, which is um, sort of that sort of man, map, the fundamentals for adaptive radiation. Um, so that's just a brief overview of the feather leg assessment bugs all around the world. And I'm going to be talking to you very briefly about my first field season in 2022, 2023. Um, so this is pretty much the route I took uh, all on the south east and eastern coast of Australia. It was a lot more miles than that. Um, and that's I had to do some weird Photoshop. So I think I ended up driving about 7,000 kilometers by myself. Like the Australia's long straight road. So you can just put the cruise control on and have a glass of wine and put the feet out the window. And um, when you're doing these sort of long drives between sites. And one thing I learned very quickly on my first build season is that Australia is very big and these flabs are very, very small. Um, and at one point I was driving around, I was talking to Matthew and I was like, oh, I can't find any bugs. They, they must all be extinct. They're extinct, we'll write a paper saying they're extinct. Then if I find one, we can say they've been rediscovered and science will love it. Um, but we did have some success in the field and we managed to find five species, um, Femoralis, Pallidus, Lima, Syndicus and Distinctus which is pretty much all the species we could find in the range that I covered. Now, amongst these findings as well is we found a color variation of potentially of Lima, um, where this one here you can see has very stark black legs and antennae. Well, we've also got some that have very pale front legs and pale antennae. So is there something going on there? I know Christian has written a paper looking at sort of the trichome comparison. There was some species in the museum where their trichome was a bit funky. Is that right, Christian? Yeah, uh, and then also we have this species here to the right, Sydnicus, where we're starting to see a different coloured back, um, which it was formally described in sort of a rough key in description of the paper, um, but it's not seen too often. So what's going on there? These are the questions we'd like to ask. Uh, and it wasn't just the, the Tillisemus we found. We also found other genus of feather-legged assassin bugs. We have an orthosemus on the left and an aradellus on the right. Um, and this sort of helps build that tree and answer those questions of why are these ones so much more different to the ones that I'm looking at. Now, really what influenced my trip and helped me plan my route and figure out where I need to go is um, very much thanks to people like Glenda here. She is a 77 year old pensioner who is massively active on iNaturalist with over four and a half thousand recordings. And she, just goes out pretty much every day, finding bugs and uploading them to the website. And as I was planning my route, I saw, you know, she had loads of great recordings and that massively dictated where I wanted to go. So, so when you're going to a foreign country and you're trying to find new species and new bugs and, you know, things you've never read, really, not much is known and you don't you know the areas as well. Things like iNaturalist are a very powerful tool, not just for seeing where people have found and recorded species, 
but also very anecdotal information um, from this. So Lima and Fer Morales, they're very much thought to be tree dwelling feather legged assassin bugs, so they actually live underneath the bark. But actually reading some of these anecdotal reports and comments, people were finding Feromalis underneath rocks, in log piles, in leaf litter, um, under rocks as well. So sort of those tiny little things that people on the ground are mentioning can really influence how we do our research and how we can sort of look for these bugs. And another tool that I use iNaturist for is absolutely harassing people to find bugs for me. Um, this was just five hours ago. I got an email from someone being like, oh, I found some bugs. Do you want them? And straight away, I harassed them. And I'm super grateful. This species they found five of is Tillicema cydnicus. Um, I caught one of the brown-backed ones when I was in Canberra, but I might have left him in the humid tube for too long. And he went a bit moldy and I was kind of freaking out, like I've only got one and it was all moldy. Matthew and Christiane are gonna kill me. Um, but luckily I've got people on the ground finding these bugs to me and it's such a relief to have sort of an army of sort of cheeky buggers out there trying to collect bugs for you. Now, as I was mentioning this anecdotal information, it can really have a big change in our research. So when I was in South Australia Museum, I was going through all their old drawers and all their old collections of bugs. And there was uh, a Tillicium distinctus, three or four of them collected by Dr. Penelope Greenslade. And she is a famous springtail expert. And on the bottom of her label, she put, found in the leaf litter of Mali slash broom. Now, most of these museum records and collections um, I had a database off and it said location data, so they were found here, but the, that very small piece of information was sort of just missed, sort of that Chinese whispers going on and wasn't translated down. And when I was in South Australia, I went to a place called Gluepot Nature Reserve, which is owned by BirdsLife. Fantastic place, they've got amazing research facilities. If you ever need to go there and want to do research on birds or reptiles or inverts in Australia, I really recommend this the place to go because they have a field station with a washing machine. It's great. Um, so I went to Blue Pot Nature Reserve and this little thought in the back of my mind by Penelope saying, Mally and Broom, leaf litter. And they had a vegetation map of the reserve and they also had in there the sort of percentages and coverage of individual species of that vegetation throughout the reserve. Straight away, I thought, oh, I know distinctives are found in this area from historical records. Let's see where is very, dominated by Mali and broom species. And I did that and I drove out there in my car and I went to a, a Mali tree with a little bit of bro broom and acacia scattered around it. And I found absolutely nothing on my first bucket. I'm kidding, I straight away I found this feather legged assassin bug, the Tillicium distinctus. And this was very much a, a species that throughout South Australia I was hunting for because based on what we knew about Lima and Femoralis, I was looking at under tree bark and on trees for them. But by having a quick shift from this tiny little sentence that someone had wrote down, I started to find this species that I was very much after. And this is what we found here. And with this finding of, of distinctus, they weren't extinct. I rediscovered them after I declared them extinct just two days before. Um, and we also, well, I also found pretty much all the stages of the nymph as well, which is great for our reference understanding of how these bugs evolve and how they are at certain life stages. All again from one simple sentence in a, in a pin in, pin bug of a museum collection that was again overlooked when someone came to transcribe some data. So with this in mind, I sort of did a habitat study, um, and there's my little rental car down the bottom. It explicitly said, "Do not drive off road," but I'm sure that dirt track roads in the outback are still technically a road, so it was covered. Is that correct? Um, so this was the area that I first found the bugs in, and was dominated by that mallee and that broom. And sort of looking around with my, with my hat on, I noticed there was sort of six distinct types of vegetation. You had she-oak, a mallee broom mix, just broom, just mallee, acacia, and just these weird little random patches of, of, of ground litter. Um, and taken into what Penelope said again, it's do they like mallee and broom leaf litter or is it just any leaf litter? I know they're in the area, so how can we, how can we look into this a bit more? And I went with my bucket and my sieve and I was sieving all those different habitat types, and this is what I found. You can see straight away, there's quite an abundance of distinctus found in Mali, not compared to anything else. There were some nymphs found in the mixed. Um, and if we do some quick and dirty stats on it, on this chi square analysis, would you believe it that it is there's a statistical difference between distinctus being found in Mali and leaf litter against everything else? So with that in mind, we can say that 
distinctus has a preference to leaf litter of Mali and Broom. So that is some groundbreaking science and I'm sure RES will want to present me that award. But hang on a second, we've got Tillicium distinctus. They're found in Western Australia and up in Queensland, but there isn't Mali forest. So we can't say exclusively they like Mali litter and the, and the leaf litter of Broom when they're also found in areas without this. So if I ask you other questions, is it percentage of leaf litter or could it be something that also drives their reasons to be there, such as their prey and ants. So I went around with my pooter in the bush, sucking up all the ants I could. And I started to do some ant actions in the library at Blue Pot. And by putting different ants in with the feather-legged assassin bugs, I started to see wildly different behaviors um, and how they interacted with each of these ants. So here we have a tectomorium species dunked in with the feather-legged assassin bug, and he absolutely just couldn't care that bug was there. He's just going to sit there and do his thing and not really pay much, too much attention. I've also discovered the lids of Ferrero Rocher boxes are quite nice and clear. So if you want to film something top down, that's great for the top of your container. Um, so again, he sat there not doing anything. And then I put a Camponotus species of ant in with the feather legged assassin bug. And he just did not love life whatsoever. He, I mean, I'm not anthropomorphizing um, the bug, but I'm pretty sure he's running for his life and he's not too happy with this big old ant being plunked in the same chamber as him. There we go. So we're starting to see already that even though these ants are found in the same habitat as and the proximity of the feather-legged assassin bugs, which are meant to eat ants, they're not liking certain species and they're choosing this avoidance or just showing no response whatsoever. And then I started to put an um, Iridomyomex species of ant in with my feather legged assassin bugs. And again, I would say they got quite excited quite quickly. Look at him go. He's waving those little feathery legs and he's going after the ant. So we must be able to say here that, you know, what's driving this? Why are they so excited to get in with this ant and interact with this ant species? Look at him go. Quite quick little nimble things. Little leg twitching. They're loving it. They're loving those ants. They're not running scared for their life like how I noticed. Then after a while, after putting more ants in with different bugs, I started to notice that all of a sudden they started lifting their legs sort of 90 degrees in the air. After they chase them around, they'd start lifting those legs up to the air, waving their hands, doing a Mexican wave. Um, and this was a very strange pose that they would hold when we were putting in just with these iridomomex species of ant. And then I'll just wait for the clip to stop. So you can see here, this is the pose they do exclusively to this one species of ant. So there must be some sort of interaction going on there. And here we are again, this is it. And they were doing this particular pose with this ant. So what's going on? What's this behavior? So after a while of sitting patiently, they do this position and the ant comes along, sniffs that gland, like I said earlier, and bam, it sticks this little sucker right in between the cuticle at the back of the head and makes a nice ant soup from its body. It's very quick and it's very fast how what happens. So we can kind of say here that maybe these legs being posed up and this interaction, it's a luring technique for them to attract and these ants. And again, this wasn't a one-off. Here's another ant going along. The ant comes along, sniffs his gland. Oh, hello, that looks tasty. Comes along, same luring method, same technique. Sniffs the baseline at the bottom of the ant to, to, to sniff that trichome, the gland. Then all of a sudden, he strikes any minute. And then they face upon the ants. So they have this luring technique where they want their prey to come and make contact with them first, which surely as a predator, you don't want to do. So we can sort of say here that, you know, this is the species that ant they are having interaction to predating upon, but not the rest. So maybe when we come back and ask that question of what's going on in Western Australia, what's going on in Queensland, is, is this ant species also found here and that's what's driving them to be in leaf litter? Or is there other species they predate upon? And, you know, as the questions go on, we try and figure out what other species of Tillicemus eating other ants, is there going to be sort of a, a ratio similarity 
in what they predate upon because clearly these ants here are very terrified of the big cab notice ants but these smaller ones that are roughly the same body size they, they seem comfortable enough to predate upon them. Now my friend Dave here did send me some footage of um, Tillisium's lemur in action doing his thing but the sound doesn't come through um, and I could quite easily butcher a David Attenborough impression here like here we have the Tillisium's lemur there's a big ant looking to find what the source of the smell is. I'm not gonna do it the whole time, but we can see here that Tillisemus lemur, a tree dwelling species, has a very similar luring technique of that it raises up to expose its glands and the ants come along, give a little sniff, and then all of a sudden, it kind of will regret that decision as it breaks upon the ant in the exact same way. So what I like to describe as here is we have like an oxymoron of luring techniques. The fact that these two species of, of feather-legged assassin bug in the same genus are using the same method to lure and attract and kill their prey, but it's also wildly different in the one that pokes his head down and raises his rear in the air, where Tillisium's lemur sticks his head up and exposes his gland this way. And I've also got footage as well of Tillisium's distinctus when they sort of get frustrated and they're not getting their predation as they want, they will really shove their bum in ants that walk by his face to try and get them to come over and lure. So again, what has then driven these species to have very similar, but also radically different techniques of luring and, and predation? And while I was in glue pot as well, I managed to collect a species called Pallidus. Now Pallidus is an odd one in the world of Tillisemus bugs. Because um, he's very cryptic and he's only really found by a light trap in arid areas. He just turns up, you're, you have people left up just doing their moth trapping, and they'll put an inaptious that they found this very interesting looking bug comes to their light trap. And it's repeatedly recorded in the collections comes to light, comes to light. So we think that Pallidus don't know much about it, just the fact it comes to light. But again, going back to that sort of citizen science and these anecdotal remarks on Atlas of Nick's. Atlas of Living Australia, someone's got some photos of Pallidus here um, in the daytime in a very arid environment, right near the same areas. Sorry, I am um, I caught my Pallidus species in the same area as I caught my distinctus. And when I was flicking through these photos, is it me or do these luring poses look very similar? So do Pallidus then have a very similar luring behavior to distinctus? We'll never know. Um, but one thing we can't always take into account really with these citizen science or naturalist recording schemes is the accuracy of what they're portraying. So he has put this down as Pallidus, um, but in my opinion, Pallidus is very similar to Borealis. And what we know about Borealis is he's a ground dwelling species of feather-legged assassin bug and often found in arid areas, the same areas as Pallidus, but he's often caught in pitfall traps, which says he's on the ground. So is this, a mis this sort of recording, is it mistaken or is it, Pallidus. you know so these are these are questions that not, will not necessarily give us the answer but will certainly stray us in the right way of you know help us do our investigation our research to see what's driving figure species or niche changes now one last observation i'll leave you with today and um, which i've noticed is on the left hand side we have the phloxenes from africa and on the right hand side we have phloxenes of australia and this is again pallidus and borealis our arid dwelling species and this could just be me sort of thinking too much into it, but their coloration looks very similar. So have they come all the way through Africa, made it through Asia and the hot tropics down the tropical coast of Australia, and then sort of re-evolved into how they originally were in these older species and this convergent evolution going along where they're re-evolving in particular niches and adaptations that they were in a much older sort of genus when they first started out. Um, so yeah, that was my brief talk on the Holopsilines of Australia. Um, has anyone got any questions? The one question I would probably answer is, what is that on the screen? Um, I asked an AI computer to draw me an ant wolf um, and it gave me some weird like seven legged ant wolf thing. So I thought it was great. I didn't know what to put in the presentation, but um, it's copyright free if anyone wants a tattoo of it. So yeah, fire your questions away. Okay, thank you. I have to stop laughing first, but let's